Greetings from Podcastville. The Church of What's Happening Now is brought to you by Squarespace. Listen, turn your cool idea into a new website. Sell products and services of all kinds and announce an upcoming event or a special project and more. Right now, you go to squarespace.com and I'm going to give you a free trial when you're You're ready to launch. You use offer code CHURCH to save 10% off your first website or domain. You understand me? Squarespace is the way to go if you want it because they have beautiful templates created by world-class designers. Powerful e-commerce functionality lets you sell anything online. And the ability to customize look and feel settings, products, and more with just a few clicks. When you're ready to put that uh, website together or get your domain, squarespace.com is the way to go. So go to squarespace.com right now for a free trial. When you're ready to rock, use offer code CHURCH, C-H-U-R-C-H, to save 10% off your first purchase of website or a domain. That's squarespace.com, enter code CHURCH. I love to introduce this company to the podcast and to the church family. And it's CBD. Listen, picking a reliable CBD company is like pulling fucking teeth. That shit ends today. You know why? Because Uncle Joey's going to hook you up with CBD Lion. Listen, they make CBD products from start to finish. CBD Lion has you covered. All right? If you love to vape, they got cartridges and the shatter. But if you're not into smoking, let me tell you something. They got these fucking gummies. That's how I was introduced to them. And the tincture. You put the tincture under your tongue, 30 seconds, you swallow. Tip-top motherfucking Miguel. I'm 56 years old. I go to two jujitsus a week, two kickboxings a week, and a strength lifting class a week. And you know what's been helping me the most lately? CBD Lions. What I'm going to do is this. Go to CBDLion.com and check out the third-party lab results yourself. But right now, the church family gets 20% off anything. Gummies, fucking tinctures, fucking shat, whatever you got, we got for you. If you need CBD, this is the company. Let me explain something to you. When I read their flyer, I was so impressed. They even tell you how CBD works with your body. So do me a favor right now. Cut this shit. Go to CBDLion.com. If you want to rub it on your shoulder, if you want to rub it on your knee, whatever CBD you need, CBD Lion has you covered. So go to CBD Lion right now and get 20% off your order when you put in church at checkout, all right? That's CBDLion.com. Lee, kick this motherfucking mule. It's my little brother, Red Band. What's happening, buddy? What's up, buddy? Ah, it's just one of those weeks. I figured we need to fucking chat with Red Band. Hell yeah. Take it back to the fucking OGs of fucking podcasting. How are you? Yeah, it's doing okay. You know, it's been a rough couple weeks, but it's, uh, I'm doing fine. What the fuck did you eat in England (laughs) that gave you poisoning? I want to know this shit right now. Uh, I I, I think it's Was it oysters? I think it was the oysters in Ireland. Don't get oysters in Ireland. Don't get oysters, period. (laughs) (laughs) I don't think I'm going to get... I love oysters. You do? I don't uh, like them. Rogan got me on. Because every time we used to always... He would always get oysters. I was always scared of them. But then I grew to love them. And and, uh, I love like all the... Things that you get from oysters. Is it Ireland like an island or on the water? Like what is it? Yeah, it should be fine. But 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 I think the place we we got the oysters at was like a tourist trap. It's like getting oysters at Hollywood Bowl, Hollywood and Highland. You uh, know, at some kind of uh, pub. You know, like you don't you don't go there to get oysters. But uh, yeah, it was bad though. That was the worst food poisoning ever, and we all got it. So uh, how me, long did it last? Uh, 24 hours. Me, Tony Hinchcliffe, Jeremiah Watkins, uh, Joel Jimenez, the our, the Mexican drummer that we have in Kill Tony, didn't get it because he's Mexican, we think, and then he had a stronger, a stronger stomach. Yeah, but he, little, you know, those he, Billy goat stomachs. Yeah. <laughs> so he used to lizard meat and toenails yeah. and shit. <laughs> fucking eyeballs. Oh my god! So or, he only got cramps. But uh, it, it, it we. Then the morning after we ate uh, or we had to go to Manchester, we had to go to the airport like 7 a.m. or whatever it was. And we all go to the lobby and I look at Tony and I look at Jeremiah. And I'm like, dude, I've been puking all night, both ends, shitting, puking. He's like, I, I can't even believe that I packed my suitcases to get out. And Tony looks at me and goes, I just went from the bathroom. Like, Same shit. Jeremiah's like, I feel really, really bad. And then we get into the cab 
and we're driving to the airport and then tony's like stop 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 we're in the middle of this traffic jam highway and tony runs out and pukes and then and then like five minutes later i'm opening the door i'm like stop and i'm and i'm like puking out the side of it we're at the airport puking and shitting all three of us going crazy i mean it was i think i should have been in the hospital like that bad of food poisoning like uncontrollable like one second you're just puking and shitting and you can't control anything now you said you were gonna run up to a cop at the airport yeah yeah i was uh <coughs> after i finally checked my bag in and whatever i was like we had to get to the gate we haven't even gone through like the like the, the security or anything like i'm like this is gonna be the i'm gonna die in at this airport i see a cop and i'm just sweat and i'm i, I i'm about to pass out like i thought i was gonna faint and i see a cop and i'm like about to go hey you know help me take me to the hospital but i couldn't i didn't have enough energy and i it was too scared i just kept on walking and man that airport situation was like an hour of just like i thought i thought that that's where and i was going to die the plane with the well tony gave me a bag like a ziploc bag and he goes here you know just in case and i'm like all right and i put it in my pocket and we we in my opinion i don't think we, I think all of us should have went to the hospital, but we were just so like, you know, we have a show tonight in Manchester. We have to get on this plane. And so I'm on the plane. I'm just like trying not to do anything. Suddenly in the middle of flight, I pull up that Ziploc bag. I fill it to the rim. No. And, and, and luckily I had eight, I was trying to drink uh, Gatorades and type, type stuff just so I had electrolytes and stuff. So when I puked, it just smelled like strawberries. So I don't think anyone was like, oh, he's puking. It was more like, what's going on over here? Because I, I was like cowered in the corner, like puking. And then I just zipped it up, put it in my, in my coat because <laughs> I didn't want anyone to know. It luckily was only an hour flight or something like that, like going to Vegas. And when we landed... I had this bag of puke and I had to like go out and like find a trash can and there was no trash cans anywhere. So I had to hide my little bag of puke at the, at the airport and uh, like underneath these carts. <laughs> but uh, then we had a show that night. All of us like were dead. Like we were sleeping uh, two minutes before we're supposed to be on the stage of this theater. We're all in the back laying on the floor of this dirty floor in this green room. Uh, and uh, we, did the show and we're all just about to die and uh halfway th through the show tony finally goes uh hey just so you know we're all about to die right now <laughs> like like we just got over food poisoning luckily 12 hours later we were in london and everything was fine but man having food poisoning a it, while traveling b and in a different country c it was one of the worst that is my biggest fear it was the worst my biggest fear is getting sick on the road mm -hmm. i had a you know, I got problems sleeping, but because of the sleep apnea machine, I can't do the heavy duty sedation pills or nothing. So I went somewhere. It was when we were doing a podcast at six in the morning. My sleeping was all over the place. We were getting up at five, two days a week. Then Thursday, I would fly out at five. And then Friday, you have radio. So it was like you, you, your sleep patterns just fucked. And I remember I did Zanies in Chicago, and you have to do downtown Thursday and then Friday and Saturday you go to the club on the outside of Chicago close to O'Hara Airport. Rosemont. Rosemont. And that Friday I was fine and that night at the 7-Eleven when I went to get rolling papers I bought Tom RPMs and I popped whatever it says one or two and I fucking went to bed and I got up in the middle of the night and I had swam at the hotel the day before. What made me swim with no earplugs on? So the ear, the water got stuck in my fucking right ear. And I'll never forget getting up and just falling straight down. Fuck. And going, thank God there wasn't a table or a desk. Thank God I fell. And like I think I landed on my suitcase, broke the fall. And I had uh, vertigo. Wow. And that... Like the two scariest times I had and in DC one time, I was doing that testosterone. All those guys, Joe and those guys, were like, you're getting older, do the testosterone. And I was doing the testosterone. And fucking, I got on the plane, I had a headache. But it wasn't just a regular headache, it was my neck. Like, I'm like, God damn, this is one of those real headaches. I got to DC and I took blood pressure medication and still I had that headache. And I fucking did the show, went to. Uh, this is what happened. That Monday, I went for a blood test. 
and I had DC that weekend. And that Friday, I woke up with a headache, and the doctor called, had a little message. And I go, why the fuck is he calling me? And I call him back. I go, what's up? He goes, where are you? I go, I'm in DC. He goes, go to a hospital. They're going to take blood out of you. I need for them to take as much blood out of you as they can because you're developing more red blood cells than white ones. The testosterone backfired on me. Something had happened. So I had to go to the fucking hospital. Wow. Fuck. I never told nobody. I fainted like six times. Yeah, I don't remember that at all. And I got back to the hotel room. I got a cab back. I drank a can of Coke, a couple cans of Coke. And I got back to the hotel room about 6.15. The first show was at 8. And I'm like, I'm, this is the first time I'm going to have to cancel. And I go, hold on one second. Let me get a can of Coke. If the Coke don't do it, nothing will. And that was the first time I had drank Coke in like three years. It was horrible. It was too fucking sweet. But I drank the whole can of Coke. I was back to normal. I did the well, two shows. There's a commercial for Coke right there, guys. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, like, well, when you go get a blood test, what do they give you? Don't they give you a Coke and... Like a Gatorade or, or a, a cookie. Yeah, a cookie. Yeah, I used to give plasma. Uh, I, had, I was so poor that I would give plasma once or twice a week or something like that. Uh, and I, I, like you, hate needles. I don't have any veins, so they're always trying to have to like poke it a million times to find a vein. But I would give plasma, and they would give us a check for like forty five dollars or eighty bucks or something like that, and they would give it so I could buy marijuana and uh, have some money for beers that night. And I would do that <laughs> once or <laughs> twice a week. Man, I don't miss those days. But, How long would it take? Uh, like an hour, I think, because they when you get plasma, what it does is it takes out your blood. You would hate this the most. Uh, it, t it takes out your blood and it takes the plasma from the blood and it's like this machine's behind you that's just spinning all your blood and then it puts the blood back in so it's like it it's it re takes the plasma out of your blood but you get your blood back type shit it's it was not worth it and uh that's how broke i was though like i was doing shit like that when i was uh in college but i don't know when it's going to take over like today, if you look, I got, I got a little cut over here. Mm -hmm. I wanted to shower and I didn't use shaving cream. I just used like fucking fungus soap. <laughs> That's what I didn't want to use the shaving cream today. So I used like fungus, that, that uh, body, whatever, when you go to jujitsu. Yeah, yeah. I used that and I shaved and I come out of the fucking shower just today, one o'clock. And I fucking went to wipe my face and it was bleeding and I was in front of the mirror and I had to actually sit down. I had to sit down. Yeah, just the just sight of it. Just a little bit of blood. Just sit down just to get... And I knew I would... I don't even trust it because I never know when it's going to hit. What about the time I got in the Southwest <laughs> and there was turbulence and I was in the bathroom? And I actually... <laughs> there was turbulence and I was pissing. But the plane made me go forward. So I banged my head on the thing. No big... I, not at all, guys. It wasn't a big deal at all. But as I was washing my hands, I go, what if... The plane does it now. And I bang my head in that mirror. I'm going to start bleeding. Oh. I fainted just with the <laughs> thought. Like I barely made it back to the fucking Southwest flight seat in the middle. Like I had to hold on. Just the idea of it. That, that was the time I was with Gabriel and those guys. And I had to take my shirt off. And my big tits were hanging. And I'm sweating on the plane. And it was when Southwest has facing seats. I think I took an edible too. That was when those... Uh, Tongue things for someone with anxiety, you really put yourself strips. through it. Jesus Christ, well, what are you gonna do? Yeah, that's when those things, strips. those uh, Listerine strips were like 100 milligram. We didn't really I never know. tried those, they were stuck together. Oh, you would God. put them in your yeah, wallet right. and they would get stuck together, <laughs> so you didn't know whether you were eating two of them or 18 of them. Mm -hmm. And I put one in one morning on a flight and it just took off, and that's what got it ignited was me thinking about hitting the glass, not even hitting it. There was no blood involved. Just the thought, guys. Like I said to you, I got to go give blood on Monday. And it's been eating away at me. Sunday, I'll be a mess. Sunday, I'll be a mess. That's why I'm going to see Whitney on Sunday. She's running her hour. How oh, cool. For uh, Netflix. So I love I'm gonna, you. I'm going to go to Flappers and watch it because I don't even want to think about it. That means I got to get up like at 7 or 7.30, take a shower, not eat. I don't think you could even drink coffee. You could drink black coffee. With your blood pressure medication, I got to drive down there on an empty stomach to give blood. That's torture. Giving blood on a full stomach, that's one thing. I could do that with my eyes closed. It's giving blood on an empty stomach. Eat that some makes... mushrooms. 
die, you fucking crazy. <laughs> you just challenge yourself, man. I just would die. <laughs> it's a Monday morning. <laughs> Listen, I challenge myself enough, all right? I don't have to challenge myself at the fucking doctor's office. That would Honey, be amazing. You have no idea. Like, everything about the doctor bothers me. I like him. When I have a doctor, I have to like the doctor and trust him. The first couple times, I'm a little standoffish. I remember when I went for sleep at me, I'm like, listen, I ain't going to fuck with you people. If there's a needle involved, I don't want to even talk to you people. And they're like, no, 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 no. There's no needles involved. That's the only reason why I went and got my sleep apnea treated. At that time, I was really bad. Now I learn how to breathe. I bring the iPad. I don't get too high the night before, so there's no misunderstandings. I don't get high at all that morning. I don't get high at all. What well, like speaking of like canceling things, like what would make you guys cancel the show? Because I, I I could feel this cold coming on on when I was supposed to leave on Friday. I was like, I can't cancel. I'm not gonna can't. Like, have you guys ever had to cancel like a show? Like, no, I've I've always worked through it, even with food poisoning, even with flus. I've done it. Uh, it sucks. You should you should just start like you know taking all the vitamin C and water and sleeping for the next three days. Well, with me, it was always considering the situation. I always considered the situation. Like, I think I got sick one New Year's and had to cancel on Joe. I'm the feature act. You know, you're the feature act. That's a complete different thing. You know, when you're sick, you call me and go, I don't feel good tonight. And we get a feature act anywhere in 20 minutes. You know, the MC will stretch or something like that. For me now, if I'm coughing... And whatever, and I'm gonna give them a bad show. I'll cancel. But anything else, I gotta move forward. A little detailing of a temperature, emotions. You know, think about Brody dying on a Friday. Every comic in America that we know how to perform that Friday mm -hmm. night. Somehow you have to learn how to overcome that stuff. Like when something bad like that happens, you have to rush to the stage to to you know so it doesn't overpower you. And that's what I had to do when, when Brody that, that Friday. I mean, every that Friday, I, I started feeling bad for myself for a second. Like, wait a second. Every other comic in America is going up on stage tonight. How do you think they feel? Sometimes in a fact, I could just imagine. You, didn't you have like a Ice House Chronicles that night? Yeah, we had an Ice House Chronicles. <clears throat> there was also a lot of, you know, just imagine being an audience member, though, that Friday, going to see a show and all the comics because uh, I talked to a lot of comics like Esther that had to go up and, and perform and it was hard for all of them. And I, I can't even imagine what the audience was like, what is going on here? This is a weird night to be at a comedy club. Um, but it was hard. It, I, I When I went up, uh, I almost lost it a few times. It's been up and down for me uh, ever since, though. Like, I'll be fine for three days and then out of nowhere, just my whole day is ruined. Well, like I spoke about grief on the podcast Sunday. <laughs> And how people grieve. We all grieve differently. I tell you what. It didn't bother me the first week. It didn't bother me the second week. It bothered me last week. Last week I had a little. I had a couple different things going on in my life. That I was hot about. And when I searched. To see what the problem of my thing. Like both people are cool with me now. And I think it was because of the Brody situation. I didn't know how to express myself. So I called it out on two different situations that were going on in my business aspect. I got into a, a little misunderstanding. And I think it was to do with Brody. Like, it comes, for me, it comes out in different ways. You know, that's why I said there's an anger issue involved with grieving when there's a suicide involved. Because at one point, you do get mad at that person somewhere along the line. It could be on the six months or the nine month or the, a year later or it could be two years later. You know, even my mother, who didn't commit suicide i felt a little bit mad at her for like a year and it like a year i was like fuck that bitch you know how can she live and not take care of herself to have a heart you know but then you really just you uh empathize with that person and then it goes away and then you accept it for what it is it's weird like i you were talking and i, I had family members pass away but up until a couple years ago i didn't have friends pass away like, that's a weird thing as an adult, having friends pass away unexpectedly. And it's, uh, it really takes it out of you. Like, it's, it's different. You know, guys, you watch the news. 
everybody watches the news, we read Yahoo, and you look at things in life and you go, wow, that's fucked up. Thank God that won't happen to me. And then one day you go to a concert in Vegas, a country western concert on a Sunday night, and you're getting fucking shot at, you know. I mean, uh, you have to appreciate all the moments, and you always have to be prepared for that situation. You know, like, we live in a world now that we could be at a carnival, and somebody starts shooting. We could be at a comedy show, somebody starts shooting. We could be at a, at a rouse, and somebody starts shooting. The same thing as with death, you know. Chris Cornell died, hung himself. It bothered us. We were fans of Chris Cornell and Soundgarden. Then the other kid hung himself, and it bothered us because we were fans of, what's that band? Uh, uh, Lincoln Park? Lincoln Park. Oh, yeah. But Brody was our backyard. Mm -hmm. That's one of us. I'm not talking about even like Robin Williams. When Robin Williams died, he was a comedy store guy. But I saw I saw Robin once or twice in my life. I met him at the, at the improv with Brogan. Mm -hmm. I, did I feel for it? Yeah, that's when it, that's when it enlightened me. And then Rudy Sarzo came on the podcast when we first started the podcast, and he spoke about that with music, with entertainment, artist. There's a thin line between talent and mental health. There's a very very thin line, and if there's a mental health issue, and we start aggravating it with the drugs to take care of it but we're no if we're trying to take care of ourselves with the drugs they give us and then when, once you add alcohol and drugs to the mix god knows where you're gonna end up you know god knows where you're gonna, where you're gonna end up you know so that's when once brody did it now i'm concerned mm -hmm. i i would i grew up in three of my like good friends committed suicide uh, just growing up in high school and uh, really? I had, yeah so i had i've had this like my whole life people killing I, it might be my personality you know but <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but no no i so but this was the first time out of all the people the first time where um i thought i had kind of a uh a, a like I knew it was uh, a problem where all the other times it just came out of the blue. They killed themselves, had no like pre, like I had no idea what was going to happen. This time it's like, oh, you know, Brody suffers with, you know, uh, mental issues. So I, you know, I got to check on this guy and I make sure he's okay. And the, the crazy thing about him is he was okay. Like recently he seemed like he was okay, like normal and, and, uh, where in the past, every time he was having an issue, he would be very yelly and, and angry and, and or he would have his sunglasses on and be very, you know, sad. And, and this I saw him a day before he, you know, passed and he, he was like, hey, Brody, hey, Brian, how are, everything seemed normal. And that's the thing that really drives me crazy is because like because we all, you know, we all love him and we would have all been there for him and we I didn't feel like we had any kind of warning at all. It just came out of nowhere. That's the part that that really digs into me that that you know, he was suffering and he didn't let us know where he usually lets us know everything about his life. It was really different. And at uh, 4 o'clock on Thursday, on Monday, the day of the we did the podcast Sunday night. We spoke about it for the first time on the podcast. I did not want to talk about it the first two or three weeks. It's just there was too much out there, and I didn't want to drag a dog into the podcast. But now it was time to acknowledge him. And, you know, like I said Sunday, what pissed me off the most was his last 10 minutes. You know, his last 10 minutes. That's what got me that none of us were there for him. We don't know if he went away in the morning, or we don't know if he decided to do this at night. You know, you and a couple other guys said they saw him the night before, and he was fucked. So obviously, I don't think he did it that night. I think he woke up to a wall of shit. And I read different things online that have been disturbing. Some people said he read the comments or a special. Or yeah, I guess he was the latest thing he was upset is that his special, which is on Amazon, uh, and it really captured 
the why we love Brody, his late night spots at the comedy store. And it, it, the whole special felt like you were sitting at the comedy store, you know, in the main room at 1 a.m. on a, a Saturday or a Friday. And so there was a few comments of people that, you know, just were like, hey, you know, rented it. Uh, oh, I don't know what's going on here. You know, like just typical normal white bread comedy people uh, saying, oh, I don't know what's going on. This guy seems like he... But that's the crazy thing is, is that when you first meet Brody, I think we all had the same kind of like, whoa, this guy, you know, at first you, it took you, oh, oh, Brody had a learning curve. Like you had to like get to know him to appreciate him. When I first met him, I didn't even live here in California. Uh, Joe, uh, this is like the first time I met you too. Uh, Joe and Doug was doing the, the, the man, show, man show and Brody was the warm up guy, the audience warm up guy. And I was living in Ohio and uh, I was like, you know what? Uh, I want to fly out to LA, see what it's like. Uh, and uh, Joe has the man show. So he, he uh, Joe invited me to be, a, be able to watch the man show like in the audience. So I flew out with a couple other people when the audience ate a bunch of edibles and, uh, and uh, Brody was the audience warm up guy. And Brody was like, clap, clap. Like we were sitting like like third row or first row or something like that. And he was just like, hey, you right there, clap. And, and for three hours, he screamed at us, like clap. I Why are you not clapping, blah, 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 doing hit, all this stuff that I love him for now. But but when you're a, a Ohio guy and you have no idea what's going on and you're, you're like, uh, I was like s scared of him. Like, like I was like, why is this guy screaming at me? I'm trying to clap as much as I can. And uh that and, that and then i think that i met you too you, like you were on the show that famous thing where you popped out naked and stuff like that uh but then when i came m finally moved to la uh the first night I, I was at the comedy store joe introduced me to mitzi and i was like talking to mitzi and i remember hearing brody in the background going yes and i was like <gasps> and I, and I, I was like having a flashback like a vietnam flashback well, oh, there's the guy that screamed at me all the time but then after getting to know brody now I love all that shit about him. Now I look back at him like, oh my God, I didn't get it. I'm laughing. But I think people saw his special and uh, s same first reaction they had, like, why is this guy screaming at everyone? I don't get it. One star, Amazon. So Brody had been looking at all these comments and focusing on the negativity of them. And I think that's that was bugging him uh, the last couple of weeks of his life. That's the one thing that I have been hearing. It's... Uh it was strange because when I first saw him, I thought because I'd heard about him on podcasts, I thought comedians were teasing him. I thought they were like kind of making fun of him a little bit behind his back. But the more that you met other people, I could you could feel the love people had for Brody. And I I, I don't know I, I mean you guys knew him better than I did. Comments will get to me, but I I just know you can't even read them. Do you think he would? Yeah, he, he I think focused he, on him. I, I, he 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 focused on all the negativity all the time. Uh, that was one of his things. Like even just one word, like what what do you say? That's not positive. Uh, I went into his apartment last night. Uh, his family had gone through all his stuff, and you know, and his f close friends and stuff were, you know, just going, you know, going through his things. They're donating a lot of his stuff, but uh, w it was my first time actually being in his apartment. Uh, and it was a very interesting walking around and seeing what Brody looked at every single day. And and one thing that was almost adorable was uh, everywhere you looked, there was like positive messages, just like like the ones you see at like, uh, uh, you know, the uh, Target where it says, like, stay positive, smile. You know, there's just like little things everywhere in his bathroom. It says, you know, uh, uh, have a good day. And you know, every single step, you just had these positive messages. Then you had pictures of him everywhere. There was one picture that was just him. It says, I'm five. And it was just a picture of him <laughs> five, at five years old. <laughs> and next to his bed, uh, he had has this big, uh, what's that thing that the Mexicans hit? Uh, pinata, a big cat pinata right next to his bed. On And then he, Larry Bird uh, on his walls and all these little trinkets and baseball toys and and uh but everywhere you go in his house there was just little signs that said smile positive energy you know all the things that he constantly says so it really made me go wow he really 
not only says that, but lives that. Like he has to tell himself every day to smile, positive energy and all that stuff. And when he doesn't, that's the version I saw when I first met him, you know, the screaming and the, you know, he really had. Was he still screaming late night? Yeah. Yeah. He was still going. Yeah. He was still, he was still doing his thing, you know, but it wasn't like, it was like his act kind of thing. It wasn't the real screaming thing. Like, like the video I showed you earlier when we first started doing podcasts, uh, it was called the Brody Stevens experiment. And there was three of them. Only one's available right now, but the other two, uh, he asked me to take him down because he was going manic. That's the Brody that, that when I first met him, where he was screaming and everything was bothering him. He would hear a dog barking. He goes, why is the dog barking? I can't concentrate and, and just yelling and stuff. Uh, it was really interesting to watch. I, I just found those two episodes and it was really interesting to watch because I could tell something was not right with him. And that, after those episodes is when he uh, checked in. What got year was in. that? Uh, 2000. 13 11 i think that's when he had the episode I he had think. zach producing his yeah yeah show on hbo enjoy it it was called i think it was enjoy it was it and uh that that was right before all that happened like literally like maybe a week before it happened where he got checked into the psych ward and and they started filming the show for enjoy it what do you guys think because i think it, it, it to me he, he was just very well known for his audience warm up. I don't think he, I think it kind of bothered him a little bit. Do you think he enjoyed the audience warm up? I don't, like, I don't, cause someone, I, the last show I did with him, someone brought him up as, like, the best audience warm up guy I've ever seen. He, he, he kind of like it. Yeah, he it, didn't like it. it. Well, it I don't of, think he, did, he doesn't like the title, but I think he liked doing it. He liked doing it. Yeah. He did like doing it. <laughs> he All liked, right. Yeah. He yeah, was still very good. At it. He, was, he was amazing. He was very, very good. I met Brody in Seattle. And at first, I used to break his balls and call into the him and Tana show and <laughs> hang up on him. Public access show. And he'd go, Diaz, I know it's you. You have the body of a 50 year old man. And he would say all this shit to me. And then. Uh, we did get they found all those tapes by the way he had all of them at his apartment which ones all the public access shows oh, every I'm single on one of them go <laughs> no I, I told uh, i told him like you gotta digitize these you gotta put these out uh there were boxes each one labeled like episode one two three so hopefully we get to see those someday so i uh you know at the underground it was a ball busters paradise we were all open micers we all ran in a pack. Me, him, Josh, Gavin. There was a bunch of us that ran six, seven deep. And we detained her, him, Josh Wolf, Tana, Mark Madison. Nice guys, you know, but at first I didn't know how to take him. And then I saw the other side of him. I saw that he was a sweet, sweet guy. So he asked me for advice and I talked him into going to New York. And we kept in touch very lightly. He was living in Brooklyn, you know, and all this <laughs> shit. And then one night I'm in the coach and the horse is fucked up to the gills. I'm snorting and I'm there with the stripper and she had her little hooker friend with her. So I said, hook her up, but Brody showed up. And Brody had the Volvo and we were so fucked up that he made me drive. He showed up at the comedy store and then we went back to coach and the horses. And he made me drive and I was coked out of my mind. and. He had Super Unknown in the cassette deck. And I took it out because I wanted it for the car. I mean, it was just, and the next day he called me up, did you take my Super Unknown? <laughs> you fuck you yeah, and all this shit. And that was the one story I wanted you to say again. Like, I just very, like, what was it in Seattle or something where you kidnapped him in his own car? Oh, and I put him in the back of the car <laughs> and I told him to shut the fuck up. <laughs> that I could make it to Gig Harbor in an hour and a half. And he didn't believe it. I was doing 90 and... And he kept saying, normal people don't live like that. <laughs> but where I saw, like, this whole time, I just thought he was a kid. I loved him. Like, I liked him, you know, and he was entertaining. But once we were on the best damn sports show, I would get there to tape in the afternoon, and those kids would get in there, and it was the best warm-up I had ever seen in my life because it was a warm-up that, Nobody warms up people like that. Everybody's very clean. And the warm up guy from Joe Rogan's show, News Radio, Joe Hayden. <coughs> they used to call him Captain Date Rape. 
Oh, my God. Because the guy wore a jacket, and he was really creepy. He grabbed grandmother's hands and shit. And then Bill Maher had K.P. Anderson. K.P.'s still around, you know. I just bumped into him. K.P. And then there was another show I used to go to, a CBS show. And their warm-up was just horrific. But once you saw Brody do a warm-up, it was something that, like you said, people would look at him and go, what the fuck is this? <laughs> you don't want to laugh? Don't. <laughs> you know, and then he would tell you something obscure. I'm a model and where was he a model from? Pakistan. Yeah. Pakistan. And, you know, and these people are like, is he being serious? <laughs> <laughs> like, there was so many nights me and, and John Cruck would just watch him do warm up and how. Like, bro, he just, and the people would be petrified. Mm hmm. Petrified. You're right. I forgot all about that quality yet, because he wasn't your traditional high. It's like seeing Holtzman, like Brian Holtzman, one of the funniest comedians in the world that no one knows about. Nobody knows about. And if you see him, uh, you might be like, "What the f same kind of reaction?" But if you get it, you're seeing some of the best comedy you'll you're ever see. Some of the best yeah. shit you'll ever yeah, see. Yeah, yeah. He was there the other night. Yeah, he's so beautiful. He Bro really is. Brody was the best part of the Oddball tour that I went to go see. Really? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, you got to see him at Oddball? Oh, yeah. Oh, and he, cool. he was on the small stage. And then for like the, for like the beginning part when no comedy was going on. And I went, I went the year. It was like Gaffigan, Sarah Silverman, um, the Nerdist guy. I'm blanking on his name right now. It doesn't matter. And Brody would go up. Brody went up there and... My ex and I, like he was, that he'd all we would talk about the whole time. Like the whole, the rest of the show was just okay. And Brody, Brody killed it you know, the whole time. It was awesome. So he was on the side stage. He hosted that, but then he, I think he warmed up the main stage too, if I'm not, if I'm remembering correctly. Yeah, he was a different type of fucking breed, man. And he just kept pounding. And listen, after he had the episode in whatever. I pulled him aside and I talked to him and said, Are we all right? I remember I, I searched him for weapons. <laughs> yeah. I would search him for weapons like the busted balls. Like, <laughs> we make sure you don't have a weapon on you and shit. And uh, listen, man, looking at it all over again, that's the last call I thought I was ever going to get, especially even, even after the show. Same. I, I, knew, I knew Brody had his little mental things, but so do a lot of people. But I never expected for him to do a swan. Never, never. I think that's what took people, you know, if you would have called me and said he got hit by a car, God forbid, or he was in a car accident, I get that. I never understood the swan dive thing for Brody. Yeah. And like I said, the last 10 minutes, if he knew how everybody felt that Monday night, if he knew how people had been feeling the last three weeks, you know, it's uh, it's just weird. It's just, but we move on. Like I said, as comedians, listen, man. When, you know, you were saying something before. I don't mean to be rude to you, nothing like that. But things are gonna happen in your comedy career. There's gonna be one day that you're in fucking Poughkeepsie, New York, about to go up, and you're gonna get a call that a loved one is dead, and <clears throat> you can't quit. You can't quit. It's gonna. The feelings are over. Gonna gonna overpower you. I was very fortunate. I was very, you know, it's a bittersweet feeling for me, because in 1995 I had this silent war going on with my wife, and I would realize that after I would drop the baby off, my daughter at that time, I would drive like two blocks down the road and mentally break down. I would cry and I'd be angry at myself and. And this went on for about two months. And Wednesdays, I would just go home, get Chinese food delivered, and I would just sit there. No TV. I would just sit there, not write jokes. I would just sit there and then wait two hours and order cocaine. That was, uh, that was what I did on Wednesday nights. But I forced myself. I said, I'm not doing this no more. For me to become a really, really good comic, I have to learn how to do comedy upset. So I forced myself to do... You know that Wednesday room I was talking about uh, here that the guy was the Elvis impersonator? With the spaghetti or something? That was the Wednesday night, and then it was Club 56 on Wednesday night. So I would force myself. So, yeah, I'm mad that I would I would look up at that guy with the Elvis suit on, 
sang it, and I would go, I can't believe I'm opening for this guy on a Wednesday night. <laughs> but at least I wasn't in my apartment. So what I would do was I would drop her off at 7, I would drive up maybe a mile, and I would have a joint in the ashtray, and I would smoke the joint, I would cry a little bit, I was dropping off my daughter, I would smoke the joint, and then I would force myself to go do comedy. First couple times, I ate a bag of dick. But then after a while, I started getting better at it, and better at it, and better, and I had just worked an avenue that now cannot affect me again. If somebody close, something close to me, I'm still able to do comedy because I've learned how to shut it off. There was a lot of people who called me that day. After 4 o'clock, I stopped taking calls that day because I knew that what the call was for. So I just took the phone, put it on off, and put it in the charger, and I went to the other room with Kate. Sick. I had my phone in the bedroom, but I was outside the living room with Kate eating cheese and shit like that, room service. Because I didn't want to feel bad. I didn't want people to keep fucking reminding me, like, before 8 o'clock. And then when I woke up Saturday, I had more. I had calls from 206. So there was a newspaper trying to call. Yeah. Because they left a message that I got that Saturday morning. I was in Seattle. Some want to know if, if you have any words for Brody Stevens. We got your number from such and such. And I was like, I'm not calling you. Like, I don't. I'll deal with it at the comedy store. So I didn't really, when I got back Sunday was the first time that I was fine with it. And, I, and then I called Josh Wolf, And I could see that he, it was starting to hit him because we had pushed it aside. We said, fuck it, let's do comedy. Let's worry about these two shows. And we'll, we'll worry about Brody on the way back Sunday. And that's when on the plane right back was where I let it digest. I cried a little more. I went home, I called Josh. And then uh, I think I called you. We all spoke, and uh, that's it. You know, that was basically it. I'm sorry this had to happen to a bunch of young guys at the store. A bunch of young comics had to witness this, but we all needed <coughs> this. You know, this happened in our backyard. This is not good. So now we have to be a little stronger as comics. Now we know that this could happen again. But we can't let it happen again. You know, Robin Williams and now Brody Stevens. So what can we do to not let this happen again? This is what I said the other day. No more texting. You got to call three people a week. Just pick three people. You know, I if you, right now we could take a sheet of paper and each of us could give it to one another. I could write three names here that I could see doing that before Brody Stevens. Oh, yeah. You understand? 100 names. I can name three names off the top of my head right now mm -hmm. just from me being around the store in the comedy game and seeing people at different clubs. There's three people I'm worried about more than I was worried about Brody Stevens. So for this not now, we have to make sure this doesn't happen again. Right. It's, it's hard to constantly deal with this in the comedy community too. It seems like it's non-stop because we're such a large family and so tight you know and there's so many <clears throat> it seems like comedians are drawn to de depression and, and sadness well, and you know it, that CNN uh, series pissed me off a little bit what well, didn't piss me off it enlightened me a little bit you know the dark side of comedy and it was just a bunch of comics talking about their struggles. Really? With, yeah. I didn't, I didn't watch it. Yeah, seeing it. They had it on maybe last year or something like that. And I listened to what they had to say, and I, I had a lot of, uh, you know, concerns. My wife goes to bed at 8.30, sometimes 9. The baby goes to bed at 8.30. And some nights, yeah, you go to a computer room, and you put music on, and you write jokes, or you look at your schedule, and you... Taylor, how you gonna do it? But at the same time, that's when that shit could happen. Go on YouTube, look at one of your videos. Some guy calls you a fat fuck, you're a waste of life, whatever. I could see all that transpiring into, but that's why I don't read the comments. I gave up reading comments four or five years ago on YouTube. I and then when you. you look at, just pick any song, just pick a great band and pick a song and go to it on YouTube. I was watching Soren Man's the same last night. 
It's got 6 million views. Well, it's got 480 dislikes. So 480,000 hated Led Zeppelin. <laughs> Who are these so idiots? If, if they hate Led Zeppelin, they're right. going to hate us. Yeah. You know, not that's what makes the world go round. Yep. That not everybody's going to love everything you do. I love when people make a comment on, you know, on Twitter to you, uh, Facebook. Sometimes you get upset because you're like, I'm trying to provide a service. I'm trying to help people out, and you got to fucking break my balls. But somebody, sometimes you got to look at where that person's coming from. You don't know. He's in a basement. He's just fucking looking around for you to get attention. Fuck him. So it's better not even to pay attention to those things. They create doubt. And it's done by people. If you had a life, you wouldn't have time to write a, a stupid comment. If you understand humanity, you wouldn't have time to. There's a lot of shit I don't like online. <laughs> There's tons of shit I don't like. You don't see me fucking write negative comments. I just switch and just click the channel. Or don't watch it. That's it. But to put somebody down for somebody trying, go fuck yourself. Yeah. What do you do? What do you do? You're actually on here. We're listening and, and looking the crit. Look at those YouTube comments from time to time on anybody, whether it's Rogan. Look, you ever see Rogan's fucking Instagram? You, you want to fucking shoot him. Like Rogan will post something about a fight, and they're talking about shit that has nothing to do with yeah. the fight. Like, uh, you know, they insinuate, and you're like, I feel bad for Joe. Like, here's a guy that works hard. He's a smart guy. He reads fucking books. He does research for his podcast. And you break his fucking balls too? Okay, then. then what kind of person are you? You know, so. 14 year old at Quiznos just pissed off at life. You know, is, that's what I always think of. Like when you read these negative comments, like who's the person that's writing this? What kind of life do they live? It's just, I feel sad. If for you had people. a life, you wouldn't have time to write. Right, exactly. We're being negative or. Yeah. Or, are you, you that know, angry uh, of a person? And you don't know what type of day a person's having. Very scary. You don't know what that person's going through. You don't know what happened with his wife before he left the house. His wife hasn't sucked his dick because he doesn't have a job. You know, when you see these uh, these careless fucking murders on the news, you're like, a person died because a person was having a bad day. Or because, you know, it's just sad. It's fucking very sad. Mental health. You know, you look at fucking leave here at night. And go on to that bridge over there. How many homeless people live over there? Tons now. There's a lot. Have you fucking coaches. seen that? Have you fucking seen that at night? And they're walking out in the street. Yeah. The other one guy was sweeping garbage onto the street. You go onto the bridge on Chandler, the bridge on Every Colfax, bridge in the valley now, yeah. by fucking the, uh, the, the open mic over there. Yeah. Did Laurel. you see that fucking bridge on Laurel Canyon? Mm -hmm. They got people living under there, you know. There's. And I can listen. I know the difference between. There's a big black dude that walks around here, six six two ninety. What do you want to do? Every time I see him, I give him a twenty. I haven't seen him in about three weeks, because I always say if if me and my wife get in a beef, I just sick fucking this guy. I talked to him a few times. He's an ex. <laughs> he's an ex uh, what, what was the the conflict in like the nineties or the one at the nine eleven? That one. Iraq War or oh Desert Storm? Yeah, Storm. Desert Storm. Uh, he's one of those guys that mm -hmm. walks around. So I know you could kill a motherfucker. Yeah. So every time I see him, I get that's a good. Money. That's a good move, man. Hey, <laughs> it's an investment in my future, yeah. my security. <laughs> He's walking past my block. I'm getting into a fight with two Puerto Ricans. He's jumping in, that fucking guy. Yeah. But no, I know the difference between mental health and fucking being a scumbag. Mm -hmm. And I know the difference between mental health and being a fucking shit heel. There's a big fucking difference, man. But we live with it. All I want is uh, the comics to heal correctly, you know. I want the comics to, everybody's going to heal from this. This is going to take a while. Yeah. I could feel it last night at the store, you know, that there was still remnants of it. So Yeah, it's still going on. It, it's still going on. And a lot of these young comics, it's their first major yes. one, too. Yes. So, you know, for someone like Jimmy Schubert, he was here when fucking Kennison died. Right. Like, you know, all those people like that, that's, you know, I was here for Marilyn. I was here for Freddie Soto. No, I miss Marilyn. I miss Marilyn too. I miss Freddie from time to time. I put the store. You know, Brody's going to be a hard one, you know. And I didn't see him as much as I talked to him. I would talk to Brody on the phone, and then him and Bert, Lee and Bert, would tell me about his videos at Starbucks around the corner. Mm -hmm. Oh, I was always, I, I, I would run into him all the time. And, and then he stopped going, unfortunately. But that's that's one thing I'm very thankful for. 
is uh, the podcast and the videos and. Yeah, we have a lot of content to watch. We have so much to see in there. We can, <laughs> that's one good thing, you know, it's because he did nothing but record himself and make sure, you know, I have like all the Broden and Esther podcasts. I uh, I have so many things to go back and watch because I, I I watched one the other day and I was just like, wow, I forgot all about this, you know. Well, and, when you showed me that one before, I didn't want to yeah. watch that. I thought I was going to fucking cry. Yeah. I don't want to watch that. It was a... It's, I don't know. It's it, it, For me, it's very... Because I, I came into this as a fan, and it was... I, 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 I do regret, and it, it, this is one thing that I've, I'm trying to take from it, is I, I never got to see him do his late night at the main room. Oh, really? I, I didn't... That's one... I'm very regretful for that. So I... But I, I got to do shows with him at, like, the Sycamore. I did, I did shows with him everywhere. And that was... With, with you at the Ice House. And that was great... But uh, I'm one thing I'm trying to take from him is from this is to is to go out and see the stuff, not wait, and I'll be like, oh, I'll see that sometime. Like I, like everyone got to see that, and then I I'm I'm bummed out that I didn't get to go see him with like the and that's one thing I I learned I didn't realize he didn't know how to play the drums. I forget who I was talking to. No, he does. <laughs> no, no, I'm pretty sure I think it was either Josh Wolf was saying one of the videos I was watching that he played it on the chairs but he was supposed to be in a music video and they gave him a real set of drums he's like I don't know how to play these well I mean he probably well, I don't know because like when you have you have a whole drum kit in front of you that's way different than like being able to like if you had like if he had a, a drum in front of him he he could play drums oh like one, like one drum yeah, <laughs> yeah but like yeah. a whole kit he didn't yeah, know how to play I don't, yeah I don't know about that but I used to love his, his periscopes he would he would play music and he would like zoom around his room a little bit for the whole time. Like he had called like a junior jam. I just I, I loved his little. He would call like he had like an intern that was setting up. It was it was just him being. He had goofy. an intern. No, it was just him saying it. Mm. He would tweet it. He'd be like, "The intern's going to Starbucks for a coffee run. Coming back soon." <laughs> <laughs> he would just goof. He would just be goofy the entire time. But I loved it. One of the things that when I was at his apartment, they were. Uh, uh, you know, like what should they donate or what should they get? And he had its box of all his drum pads. And I was like, you know what? I don't want them just to throw this away. So I have all his little drum pads and his little drums that he would do with the little speaker that yeah. flashed and stuff like that. I think I'm going to just hang it up at the studio or something like all his pads. And- I love that he would tour with it. He would bring yeah. it on the road. What did you get? So you took the drums? I have it like his little drum pads, uh, his little shakers, of you know, and all that stuff. His little Bluetooth thing that he uh, would play to. Because that's what I used to love is watching him just sit there and play drums in his thing. And on a little bouncy, on a little medicine ball yeah. or something. I also, I also have a lot of stuff that I, I think I'm going to scan in and uh and make it available to friends and family and f- fans uh like old set lists in in like uh like i have set lists from like 2000 like 20 years ago you know or 15 years ago it just says nipples uh beard uh scar you know like and you know it's fun to see uh like set lists or where he had scratched off and he's like too dirty or something like that it's just so adorable like looking through all this stuff and his little notes and stuff uh, so I'm ready to try to get that out there for people to look at and download or whatever it's very hard for me to comprehend so it's very hard to explain to people that this comedy life has been tremendous like this has just been tremendous this comedy saved my life you know, comedy put a smile on my face. Comedy made me fall in love with something that I knew was there, but I never knew I was capable of doing. Like I saw it in the movies and all these things that I'm doing, I wanted to do, you know. And now I got an opportunity to go, I don't really want to do movies no more, you know, unless it's the movie. I don't want to do this. But, you know, last week I went to Houston and I was fine. You know, I wasn't thinking about Brody. I was just looking forward to Monday. I was looking forward to a couple of things. And then something, life just stops you. You know, a lady came to the show and she gave me a hug. And, you know, she goes, do you remember me? And you try to be nice or polite. I went out there Thursday and took some pictures. And 
She goes, I was at the show the night you took your dick out and chased Rogan <laughs> off the stage. <laughs> And, and it's just like I had forgotten that whole memory. Like that whole thing had been. I don't even think Joe and I have spoken about it. <laughs> Were you in Houston with us that time? I don't I, think so. I it was for, feel like it. I know. I, it maybe. was. For, it was for Fear Factor, and he had gone down there to promote his CD. So we worked Addison Friday, Saturday, Sunday, and then we rented a car and drove to Houston on Monday. Tuesday and Monday we went to a record store. We bought clothes. You know, he bought me clothes. <laughs> and I was, you know, you went to a record store with him and you picked up three CDs and he would pay for them and shit. So I picked up Freddie Prince Live from Chicago and some Red Fox album or something. And me and him drove to Houston. And at this time, Joe did not get high. So it was the longest ride of my fucking life. In those days, it wasn't like, go on the call. Let me just smoke this <laughs> joint outside. Yeah, he would get mad he at you. He would it. get mad at you. Yeah. So I was smoking cigarettes, and he let me smoke them in the car with the window. That's kind of crazy. That was, cool. <laughs> that was cool. That was cool. He was having a good time. Yeah. He was first starting to headline. Like, he was, I think, uh, news radio had just wrapped up, and he still really wasn't into Fair Factor, but Warner Brothers I had given him money to do an album. And the album release party was in Houston. That's what it was. The album release party was at a sports bar. Warner Brothers did it at a sports bar. And we were like, why would you do it at a sports bar instead of the laugh stop? So we ended up going to the sports bar. Like eight people showed up to get their CD signed or their album signed. It was me in the middle with my dick out and the cape on, mm -hmm. that, that mm -hmm. one. Yeah. So that's why he took me with him. And then Tuesday, we did the open mic Monday night in Houston, which Houston was known for, the best open mic in the country, eight to fucking... That laugh stop. The laugh stop. Mm -hmm. And then we went out. We went out with Mungle and everybody, Outlaw Dave, the DJ. So we ended up in Lola's in, in, uh, in Montrose area, a fucking bar that had no windows, you go in there, and you're like, hi, I like a maker's mark. And they look at you and go, it's seven and seven night. <laughs> That's it. We got seven and seven in Heineken's. What's your choice? You didn't go in there and order a drink. They told you what you were drinking. So you might go in there one of the fucking martini. And they're like, nah, it's Greyhound night tonight. <laughs> vodka and grapefruit juice. I don't like grapefruit juice. Then it's vodka night. You know? Then it's vodka night. Well, I don't like vodka. Well, we got fucking, what's the beer they drink in Houston? Uh, Shiner? Shiner. Yeah. We got Shiner. That's it. So I took Joe there and it was packed. And you know, in those days, I could only hold out so long. So I waited for Joe to get drunk. A little drunk, which he was very hard to do in those days. Mm -hmm. Just one shot, like where he wouldn't pay attention. And I went and got a package. <laughs> and, when, and I'm doing the package with Outlaw Dave. And I could tell Joe knows I'm fucking coked up. Me and Outlaw, there's got to be three other people that are doing fucking coke around Joe. And at two or three in the morning, outside of, we decided, he goes, what am I going to do tomorrow night? And I'm like, I don't know, what do you want to do? He goes, this is so much fun. He goes, fuck it, let's do a free show. So we left Outlaw Day. We went and got breakfast with Outlaw till about four. Then we went back to our hotel rooms and then went back to radio at eight. And he told the city of Houston he was doing a free show. He called Mark Babbitt, woke Mark Babbitt up and said, I'm doing radio. Get somebody down there to the to the club to answer the phone, to put the names on the list. And we did a free fucking show. That's great. And then Joe went up there and the the the, the old laugh stop had the same thing that the comedy store does. I could really get to you from the original room. Behind people don't know that I could go if I go in the back bar, mm -hmm. there's a hallway back there. Like oh, that's curtain, right, I forgot about that. <laughs> and you could slip into that stage. Yeah. And I would go behind that stage and open up the curtain naked mm -hmm. and flip up and then close mm -hmm. it back again. So I went into the back of the uh, the lap stop and I forgot that they had done improv there. On like Sunday nights it was improv night. Some group would come in and they'd have whatever the fuck you call it, like stunts. What, what do you call those? Props. 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 And they had like one of those King Tut fucking things, so I took my shirt off, <laughs> and I put the King Tut helmet on, 
and Joe is on stage, and I'm like, he's gonna get pissed. <laughs> he's really gonna get pissed if I do this. So I waited towards the end of the set, and I fucking came out there, fucking with my dick out, and he just looked and looked again, <laughs> and I'm like, give me a hug. He's like, get the fuck out of here. And somebody taped it. The place went fucking oh, that's nuts. Hilarious. The place went bananas. I mean, no. I remember looking to the back of the lap stop. Remember there was a long row mm -hmm. in the lap stop. You all had to sit together if you took the last table. It was a great seat. It was just a row where 60 people shot, sat. It was like going to church without the wow. middle. So it was just a long thing with tables. And I'll never forget people standing back there, clapping. Like, I'm looking back there. And I'm naked from the pants down, and people were just on their cushions clapping. I was like, holy shit. And that lady showed me the picture and said that was the night. I'm, wow. That had to be 18 fucking years ago. And then you came on board. And then I started recording and, all those nights. <laughs> this is what people don't realize, that Joe was traveling with six motherfuckers yeah. at this time. Do you remember being in San Jose and Denny would show up with half the jiu-jitsu school. Oh, yeah. And him and Eddie Bravo would take their shoes off and jiu-jitsu in San Jose. What about the time we went to Tempe? And they, oh, and they had the, the fight off. The fight off. Yeah. What? Oh, you have no idea. You guys have no idea. And Adam was there at the time. He was a yeah, waiter. He was Adam a waiter. was the waiter. <laughs> the general manager of the comedy store was a waiter at the Tempe yeah. Improv. And there was a guy that was like a purple belt one night. Yeah. So him and Tate went at it first. The Indian guy. Not like serious, like good guys. Yeah. Nobody was throwing punches or yeah. nothing. But in those days. Like a tournament? No, in the middle of the lobby. In the middle of the lobby. <laughs> every fucking night. Every fucking night with Eddie Bravo in those days. So Denny would come. Denny was 16, mm -hmm. 15, and we would sneak him into, into, about that. <laughs> into Cobbs. Yeah. Upstairs. Mm hmm. Remember when we ate so many chicken things that the people at Cobbs told us no more, and I went off? Oh, that's right. Do you Too remember? Chicken tenders. <laughs> ah! They had the best chicken tenders you ever had. So mm -hmm. we. But How many they, could you eat? Oh, it was three in order. We put in the oh, yeah, RE. Right. Oh, that's right. All, <laughs> ah, nobody remembers that one. I we remember nearly that. quit. We told Joe Rogan, <laughs> we're getting the fuck out of here. This motherfucker won't give us no more chicken strips. And he's like, all right, all right, all right. I was only playing with you guys and oh shit. Oh, my God. Johnny Appleseed or whatever. What was his name? name? Johnny Appleseed? No. Uh... What was the guy? Okay. <laughs> then there was Tom Sawyer. Tom Sawyer. Was the guy that had the crush on Joe. <laughs> that you went downstairs the one day, and he showed up with a two-seater. Uh, P.F. Cruiser. Oh, that, yeah. Ah, <laughs> nobody remembers that. That he always wanted to be alone with Joe. <laughs> so Joe would always bring you and Duncan. Remember the time mm -hmm. you and Duncan had it out? Oh, yeah. The restaurant? Duncan stabbed me with a pen. You threw the, you threw the fucking hat at him and shit. <laughs> you came down and you're like, thank you for fucking taking me to radio. <laughs> and I'm like, what the fuck is going on here? We're all friends. All of a sudden, the hat flies across the table and shit. <laughs> Fucking tremendous. Holy shit. What about the hotel we stayed at where there was supposed to be like a ship? Oh, yeah. Above. That, I still stay there. I now. still stay there, too. <laughs> I like that. I place. stayed there a couple of years With ago. A good, good chowder place. Uh, above the chowder yeah, yeah, place. Yeah, the blue. That's where me and my uh, wife stayed last year. Like the that. blue mermaid. Or whatever. Hey, Remember when they found the body across the street in a suitcase in the, in the ocean? We we're staying oh my there. Oh, God. <laughs> And oh they, they found a person all chopped up in I remember that I woke up and there was cops everywhere. I couldn't go outside and smoke a joint. I thought they were there for me. We had a run where, what about the time we were in the hotel room? And the hotel, the kid sprayed the fucking spray. Oh, the and fire extinguisher. The fire alarm and yeah, Segura. I thought we were all going to die. You and Rogan yeah. were running down the Rogan stairs. wrote a bit about that. Did he that? Really? Yeah. yeah, that's right. That was the worst. Because I, I, remember, I, I remember I kept looking. The alarm was going off. And I get up and I'm like, if you think. I'm leaving this hotel room. <laughs> You're fucking crazy. Mm -hmm. what, what, what if there was really a fire? It seemed like a real fire, too, because there it was so much like smoke. <laughs> because of the I fire opened scene. up the hallway, guys, and I saw people <laughs> running, and I just slammed the door, and I'm like, if this is a false alarm, I'm going to beat the fuck out of this. <laughs> so finally, it was like at 445. My flight was like at 7. Mm -hmm. Anyway, so I'm like, God damn it. And I remember looking out the window and seeing people out there, and I'm like, oh, shit. This might be fucking serious. Yeah. So I packed up my sleep apnea machine. I was leaving in the morning anyway. 
You guys were staying. That's when I would work Sundays, and Joe would get pissed. So smart. So ahead of the time you were. <laughs> I was like, I'm not working Sundays. I think you made that rule for most comics nowadays. Like, <laughs> Yeah, no, no. There's no reason to work on Sunday. Leave me the fuck alone. Yep. So that Saturday night, I look out, and there's people downstairs. I open up the door, and people kill themselves to run down the stairs. Oh, yeah. I was about to throw myself out a window and just start punching and the alarm kept going, ah. Uh, Jesus. Uh, and I'm sitting there going, you know what? I am not in the fucking mood to pack. <laughs> but once I looked out again, I go, this is serious. There could be a fire. But I didn't smell no smoke. So I packed up my sleep apnea bag. I took my little bag. And I went to the elevator and pressed it. The elevator opened right up. You, That's right. You wanted <laughs> Yeah, because there was a spiral, a one of the spiral, the spiral staircase, staircase like, every, like 12 floors. And I'm or whatever looking it was. down and going, why are these people running when you can take the elevator? I would love to see the face on the people in the lobby when the elevator door Oh, when they went bing and I walked up <laughs> and they just looked at me like, because they made you go outside. Oh, no. Yeah. So now I come out and I don't see none of my friends, but I look up and I see Rogan, Segura, and you on the street corner mm -hmm. looking up. And they're like, where the fuck have you been? On the elevator. <laughs> That's right. I had to pack. Yeah, I had to pack. And wasn't there, and there was something behind, like a lady, a stripper or something. Remember there was like behind us, the woman came out or something happened. There was like a hooker. Hooker. Hookers. <laughs> there was hookers out. And yeah. there was a hooker, Chinese hooker place. Yeah, right like across halfway the Halfway up the corner or something <laughs> yeah. like that. You have no fucking idea. <laughs> we used to fucking go on the road with six of us. I still remember getting the big table like at Papa Do's. Mm, we would go to Papa Austin. Does. We and the hotels are across the street, right across so we just street, all walk. The tree. That's the best. We, we had, that was Houston? Yeah, that's where the picture of me yeah. is like this in the pool with, yeah, Ari, with Ari. That Ari took of me. No, with no, that, that's in that's Phoenix. Austin. No, that's Phoenix, that, that weird resort with the waterfalls and Jenna Jameson and all that stuff. Remember? they had uh, That was the uh, other oh, one. Uh, that was the crazy one up at the rocks. Yeah, all the rocks that you were like up going on vacation or something. That was spooky up there. That, that was, I don't like Because we couldn't fucking go nowhere. Yeah. You had to walk that was before down Uber. Yeah, you had to walk down the road with snakes crossing it. Yeah, there was no place to get like water. I remember going to the fucking lady and going, "Hi, hey, where's there a restaurant around here?" <laughs> and they're like, "You got to walk down the dirt road. You got to wait and take a car or call a cab or something." I'm like, "Fuck that! I'm gonna walk." She's like, "You better not." There's there's rattlesnake season. Jesus Christ! Yeah, I, like I didn't that. like that place at all. The the, the brute. The boot. The boots. The roots. Butts. The but the butte, yeah. The buttes, <laughs> B-U-T-T-E-S. Yeah, yeah. Beautiful hotel, oh, the yeah. Phoenix Tempe yeah. area. Yeah. But it's just so away from everything. Yeah. So I, I don't know if the lady was messing with me. I don't think she said, I, if I was you, I wouldn't walk out there. Fuck that. And I'm like, why not? She goes, because it's rattlesnake season or something weird. Yeah, it was in the so middle of nowhere. There. And then we had to wait for Joe to wake up, and he had the rental car. Yeah. And then we'd all go down. You know, if you really think about it on paper, like the thing with me and Rogan, was probably 99, 2000. And the stuff with you, you said, had to be 2004. Really? Yeah. So it was before the longest yard and we were hanging out? Yeah. And we were doing all that shit when you were texting me? Yeah. And I would chase you around? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then Atlanta is what we called Duncan. The Atlanta punchline is where we called Duncan and made the tape of me accusing him. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of devil yeah. worship. That was really bad outside. Satanic. It was really hu humid there. That's I hated right. that I hated club. that so much. I hated that club because Monday morning we had a drive during the fucking rush hour. And it was like an hour and a half drive to the fucking airport because it says the Atlanta punchline, but it's really not Atlanta. Yeah. It's like an hour outside Atlanta. Oh, no. So you would have to drive a fucking hour on Monday morning. That's when I stopped all. Listen. Mondays, I just figured out. That's when day. you were yelling at Rogan. Remember the video of you you screaming at Rogan? Uh, I uh, think that was Texas. Oh, when what? we had the van. Oh, okay. When he had the white van, he insisted on fucking renting a car. <laughs> Every fucking time we went, I would say to him, Joe, you don't know where you're fucking going. Why do you rent a car? And he would get that Siri, whatever that lady's name is. Uh, the GPS. It was, it was like first GPSs. And both of you would be driving me fucking crazy with the GPS. And it really wasn't any good. Make a left in 3,000 seconds. Make a fucking right in fucking 22 minutes. And I'm like, guys, knock it off with the rental. Then on fucking rental on Sunday, we had to bring back the rental car and fucking walk with all that fucking luggage 
to the. I remember one day he parked far away to break my balls. <laughs> I remember calling him when we got to the hotel room. I go, "You ever fucking park far away? I'm flatting those fucking tires." <laughs> you know, he was my brother, and I couldn't say nothing to him in front of people. But I would call him up in his hotel room. You know, next time you make me walk that far with fucking luggage, I will flatten those fucking tires with a knife. We will fucking be hoofing it back to the airport. You understand me? Oh. You park in front of the fucking hotel from now on mm-hmm. and let us out with our luggage. No, he, him, he, him and tight with Johnny Shape. We're going to be in shape. <laughs> We're going to park two miles from the hotel and walk with our fucking luggage in the heat of the fucking summer. You're out of your mind, man. <laughs> Johnny Shape. You know, it's just, it just looking at those pictures and talking about all this. There's a... The, a video I made a long time ago when we were in Philadelphia, uh, me, you, uh, Joe, and I think maybe Tate. Uh, oh, Ari. No, Ari. I think it's called, if you type in, Joe Show Philadelphia. But that had the GPS. I put the GPS in there for you at the beginning of it because it's like, up ahead, turn left. Up ahead, and you're like, because like, it was all about that same thing. It used to fucking thing. drive me crazy. All that shit drove me fucking crazy. The computers, the same cell phones. Oh, yeah, you used to hate cell phones and texting. I remember before, remember when I used to have the laptop up at Cobb's? And and I broke it. You you, you like grabbed me like, no, turn that thing off. Turn that fucking thing (laughs) off. That was when I, you know know when that happened? That was my 90th day off cocaine. Yeah. I quit cocaine that November 15th, and we went to Cobb's at the beginning of the year. And I didn't like being on, like, I was raised that if the phone's on the hook, they could even hear you. Mm Mm-hmm. So in those days, you guys would open that fucking computer up, and I was petrified of it. <laughs> petrified that the CIA was watching me, <laughs> along with the cocaine and all that shit. And I told him one day, I go, Brian, close that fucking computer. And Brian would put the camera on me and leave it. <laughs> and I fucking broke the computer. Rogan came up. Rogan had to pay for the fucking computer. He didn't talk to me for three weeks and shit. <laughs> But yeah. what, I tell you what the scariest time ever was, that tape you made of me. Joey D is ready to die. Ready I think die. I think that's still available on YouTube. That's terrible. I watched that like four years ago and I was like, boy, that's the legend. I, I it that was a rough time, man, because that you know, that I really thought you had made me believe that you were dying. Like you said your spirit left you and you just like you didn't want to live anymore. And I remember making that video uh like my mission in that video was to document what you were going through and try to like show you that we love you and everything's going to be okay and happy that's why if you watch the video it starts off so sad and depressing and like you're talking about how you want to die and then it's you on the plane singing on american airlines singing <laughs> we were in that fake band uh 10 inch screws or whatever that's right 10 inch screws <laughs> instead of nine inch nails we all had wigs on, and uh, you were. How, by the way, how did we? I thought we were all going to get arrested when we did that because twice on the way there and the way back, you we somehow tricked the stewardess into letting you get on the intercom and singing Biggie. <laughs> My, I don't know which one of those it was. One of those you, in the middle of the song, you go, Rogan, I want, I want to race. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. That was, <laughs> that was the my favorite line. Yeah. Rogan, I want to race. Because well, Rogan said to me, if you get up there and sing, I'll give you a raise. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and you did. Yeah. And that was the one of the most amazing and shocking, because this was after 9-11. So the fact that they let you like take over an intercom system. Oh, my God, I was rapping. And you're rapping. You're oh, like, crazy. who is this calling me at 6 in the morning? That was crazy <laughs> shit. And then you switch songs in one of them? You know. <laughs> That fucking Vegas thing, ready to die. Yeah. I can't tell you the damage I did that week. I got a call from one of my best friends ever. And he goes, we're going out to Vegas. A bunch of us on this date. And I go, that's crazy. Because I'm going to be there too on that day. We were at the House of Blues. I think Friday and Saturday, right? Mm-hmm. Or was it no, I- Friday, you have Saturday. Friday was the thing. Yeah. And Saturday was the UFC. Yeah. Okay. First of all, I had done the longest yard. We talked about this the other day, and I was fucking depressed because nothing came out of it. Fucking Chris Rock got the show. Fucking uh, the black guy got a show. All of a sudden, the other guy got big. And the only people who stayed the same were me, 
Lobo and fucking Nick Totoro. Everybody else got something on the longest yard. Everybody. Everybody. Everybody hates Chris. Uh, Cheeseburger Eddie. He's big of Terry Crews. I mean, you know. Go, so all these people had everything. I got nothing. Nobody fucking called me. I was thinking about quitting comedy. But when I would go to Vegas, there was a kid that would go to the UFCs. And he was part of the UFC. Like something, he did something for the UFC. And every time he'd see me, he'd look at me in the stands, they'd go. And then he'd go like this, like call me. And I think that that Thursday, I got his number. That Thursday when you made that tape, this is no shit. Like we got into town and I lost you guys. Like I was like, I don't feel good. I'm going to stay in my room. Fuck you. I remember this. That guy brought up an eight ball and mm-hmm. he would bring up the come down package. It was an extra ten dollars. It was two Vicodins, two fucking Valiant. That's a good deal. So it was one ten for the package <laughs> and he would deliver it to your door. I think I spent six hundred dollars that weekend on Coke. Yeah, I remember that weekend. And my friends kept calling me going, Hey, we're over here. These are my high these are my friends from high school. And they're like, we're over at this hotel. Where we got a free fucking dinner. Come over. And I go, I'll be within 10 minutes. And I would never show. And then they couldn't come to the show because they were going to a bachelor party. And that's what happened that Friday night. It was like after I had done two eight balls. And I had done pills to just straighten out for the show. Like this is, this is when I was to the point where I was snorting till six and not sleeping. Like I was to that. So when I taped that, that, that's after being up 48 hours. You could see the bags under my eyes. How fat was I? Oh, God. It's oh amazing. God. Yeah. The difference is. Uh, oh, my so God. Insane. I couldn't even breathe. Yeah. I couldn't even breathe. It was like I had 30 pounds on my chest all the time. And I'll never forget talking. Like I was serious. Like I was done. Like mm-hmm. I was done. Like nothing happened from this movie. I can't stop snorting coke. I can't stop. Like, and it's just getting worse, guys. Like, I can't stop. And Rogan wanted to pitch a show about calling Saving Joey Diaz. Yeah. Where they come to my house and do mm-hmm. blood tests. Yeah. And piss in a bottle and shit like that. And that was starting to get on my nerves. Yeah, I remember that. I don't that. know if you remember. Like, yeah. I don't want nobody taking blood out yeah. of me. Yeah, I nobody, remember the phone calls. I was, yeah. And, and nobody better come to my fucking house and wake me the fuck up. Or I'm going to start shooting some people. Like, I was. We were we were about to do an intervention. Yes. That's what, what it was leading to. And that, yes. And it was that bad. I could feel it now, how bad it was. And when I saw those tapes a couple of years ago, I almost called you to say to take them down. But I didn't want to take them down because I wanted to show people that you could be in a horrible fucking spot in your life. That was one of the worst spots I was in my life. Like, I had a little bit of money. Like, I was making a little bit of money. Not much. And all of it was going to blow. And all of it was going to blow. I mean, I couldn't control it. I could not control it. I'd like to know what year that was to see if if I was even on the heroin yet. Like, there was a time in that dark shadow that I got into heroin. Like, I was doing fucking heroin. Heroin? Jesus. I didn't know you did that. Yeah. Well, not even that. Wasn't that one? Wasn't heroin the thing that you convinced yourself would cure yourself of the blood? Yeah, but it wasn't. You know, guys, you have to. I wanted to take that down in the worst way a couple of years ago, and I go, no, leave it up, because I want people to see who the fuck I was in two thousand. It had to be. Look, it looks like around two thousand ten, two thousand eleven. No, 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 because I was still snorting. I was still snorting, so it's got to be... No, it's earlier than that. Yeah, it's got to be before November of 2011. It probably was February or March of 2007. I was on my last leg. I really just wanted to die. And then maybe a few weeks after that, I saw the Ray thing, the movie about Ray or something like that. Yeah, Ray, yeah. What year did Ray come out? What year did Ray come? He's going to look it up now. Oh, four. Oh, four. So when I saw Ray, yeah, look at that. Look at that. Look how big he is there. Yeah, well. Remember Diana Ross? Your voice is different. Oh, my God. What are we doing? That's, that was when Joe was doing push-ups with a reporter. Remember at the Houston? 
oh, here's you. Remember we were, we sat outside uh, with Tate. You're talking about mugging the <laughs> mugging the pedophiles yeah. that's in County Park. <laughs> Look at that fucking, look at that Big Daddy shirt. Big Daddy <laughs> used was to, used to have, that's all your, all every had, outfit. Every you, outfit I had was Big Daddy. I was spending all my money on Coke. The only clothes I had was Big Daddy sweats. Do they even exist anymore? No. They got sold and sold and sold until they finally realized nobody wanted to be Big Daddy no more. <laughs> so fuck it. It's weird what we used to wear. I remember I used to always wear skin Remember skin? skin yeah. yeah, the skin guys. And I uh, still have the hats. Yeah, I still have one shirt or two shirts. They gave us our first shirts for yeah. the church. Yeah. That kid's still around. And Is his he? girlfriend died. Oh, really? God rest her soul. Oh. She died of like asthma. Oh, no. Really? Something crazy. Like yeah. she got sick or something. Those guys were great. They used to give us boxes of shirts. Yeah, they were good. He's still around. That's He's in cool. Vegas. He's a very good guy. I like him. Red Band, I'm really sorry about Brody. I know what he meant to you. And, uh,. I'm really sorry. I know that. I always tell my wife, when I die, nobody's going to suffer more than Red Band because I know he loves me and shit. And he's got 2,000 pounds of video on me. He's going to make like $2 million and shit. No, no, no. I'm really sorry about Brody. And uh, I just wanted to bring you on today just to talk some shit. uh, It's great catching up. Yeah, yeah. And just the fact that We've been in this game almost 20 years together. You were just a baby when I met you. I gave you the Coke in fucking Austin. Strip club. What was the name of that strip club? Stan Hope's friend. We always went. Lucky Strike. No, 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 no. no. Uh, Queen Mary or something. Not she does. Uh, They would pick us up at the fucking. Yeah, in like a a limo bus. A limo bus. And the strip club would just pick you guys up? Yeah, and just take us right there. And then he gave me a package, and I was in the bathroom, and that the guys like the bathroom attendants like, hey, you can't be doing that in here, but you know, and stuff like that. I and left the next morning. Rogan called me. Did you give Fred Red blow us? Now you got to go in the fucking bathroom. Last night. I'm like, I don't know nothing. <laughs> yes, you did. I don't and, know nothing. Call and, me back. And then one time in Vegas, when you got that eight ball and stuff that you were just talking about, you gave me a little package and I put it in my front of my jacket. I forgot about it, and I flew back home with it. And like years later, I wore that jacket, and I was like, "What?" Oh, and I found it, and I was like, "Oh, this is great." <laughs> <laughs> We're still here. Yep, and that's all that matters. You got any dates coming up? With you know, everything is at DeathSquad uh, This Friday, though, uh, Lee's going to be there at the Ice House uh, in uh, Stage Two, eight thirty show. Uh, if you want to just swing by too, fucking Ice House Chronicles. Yeah, still I going do an Ice House strong. Chronicles still. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm gonna be. Where the fuck am I gonna be? I'm gonna be in uh, Pittsburgh Improv. Guys, the shows. Three of the shows are sold out already. The other two are almost close. I think they're gonna add a late show Thursday. There you have it. And then uh, 419. I'm at the Fitzgerald Theater in Minneapolis. And 420. I'm at the fucking Paps Theater. Who's that? Smoking dope in Milwaukee with the spirit of fucking LeBron and Shirley? Jeffrey Dahmer. Oh. <laughs> Me and Jeffrey, I'm bringing Jeffrey Dahmer back yeah. from the dead. Anyway, thank you guys for listening. I want to thank Red Band. I want to thank the Christ Killer. I want to thank you guys for supporting us. Sorry about the podcast this week. We all had to heal some way. This is the best way to do it. We'll be back Monday morning. Tip top motherfucking Magoo. All right. Here's for a word from our sponsors. All right. I want to thank Red Band. I want to thank the Flying Jew, but most importantly, I want to thank you fucking savages of death. Do not forget, Pittsburgh, I think there was 40 tickets left, and we might add an extra show for the late show on Thursday night. That That's all gone. Friday's gone. Saturday's gone. There's going to be some action for you on Thursday. And then March 9th, April 19th, pre-420. I'm going to listen. I'm pulling into Minneapolis lit on fire with fucking buds in my ear. You understand me? I'm over at the beautiful Fitzgerald Theater, downtown Minneapolis. And then 420, the Paps Theater in fucking Milwaukee. Me and Jeffrey Dahmer sparking fucking numbers, eating fucking toes. You know what I'm saying? Who who gives a fuck who they belong to? Anyway, real quick, I want to introduce you to a new company I love. I uh, They sent me a box and I tried out their stuff. And it was so good, I reached out to them. This is a fucking... I reached out to them. Uh, I started with the gummies. They had these gummies. They don't get you high, nothing like that. But I couldn't believe how good I was feeling in the morning. You know, there's a lot of CBDs companies out there. You don't know what to do. You don't know where to start. 
Thank God. Thank God that I get these fucking little treats and I get to try them out myself and I get to tell you about the results. But CBD Lion is the way to go. They make CBD products from start to finish. CBD Lion has you covered, all right? When you go to CBDLion.com and check out their third-party lab results yourself, you're going to fucking flip. Listen, whether you like to vape it, if you like to vape, they got cartridges and chatter. If you're not into smoking it, then forget about it. Eat a gummy bear or do what I do. Go with the tinctures. I put it under my tongue, 30 seconds, bam. When I wake up in the morning, guys, I'm telling you the truth. I'll even make a fucking video of me taking it. When I wake up in the morning, the last month, the last six weeks, I've been waking up with a little pep in my step. Even this morning, I didn't sleep too good last night, but I wasn't fucking sore. And I went to jujitsu yesterday and got tortured. So do me a favor. Go to CBDLion.com right now. If this, read everything you, they got terpene potential health benefits charts. They got so, inform, so much information on their webpage from disposable cartridges, tinctures, disposable vapes, CBD lotion, CBD isolates. Listen, for anything CBD, go to CBDLion.com right now. You On the way out, in the box, you press church, C-H-U-R-C-H, and you're going you're gonna to go, Joey, where the fuck did you find these fucking savages? CBDLion.com. Let me ask you something. You ready to start a new business? You really want it to stand out? Well, get it started with Squarespace, all right? Because you think it, you dream it, and then you make it happen. With Squarespace, destiny is calling. It says you need a new website. Make it with Squarespace. The future's coming. Make it brighter with Squarespace. Stop dreaming. Make it a reality with a website from Squarespace. Listen, you can create a beautiful website. Turn your cool idea sell products and services, promote your physical and online business, and announce upcoming events or special projects, okay? That's what you got there. So if I was you, I'd head over to squarespace.com right now because they're offering the church family a free trial. When you're ready to launch, use offer code CHURCH and save 10% off your first purchase of a website or a domain. Listen, Squarespace does it by giving you beautiful templates created by world-class designers. The ability to customize the look and the feel, the settings, the products, and more with just a few clicks. Everything is optimized for mobile right out of the box. It's a new way to buy domains and choose from 200 extensions. Analytics that help you grow in real time. A built-in search engine for, for optimization. Free and secure hosting and nothing to patch or upgrade ever. And 24-7 award-winning customer support. That's what I want when I put up together a website. So do me a favor. Head over to squarespace.com right now for a free trial. When you're ready to launch, use offer code CHURCH, C-H-U-R-C-H, and I'm going to give you 10% off, all right, from your website or your domain. That's squarespace.com, enter code CHURCH. I want to thank Squarespace. I want to thank cbdlion.com. But most importantly, I want to thank you guys for being fucking savages and for having our backs. I'll see you guys Monday morning, ready to go, tip-top magoo, okay? Have a great weekend. Don't forget about me, and I'll see you motherfuckers next week. Throw them a kiss, Lee. There you go. Stay black, cocksuckers. Uncle Joey loves you. See you next week.